Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the webinar, Sustainable Energy for Household Cooking Needs. My name is Ranisha Basnet, and today I'll be moderating this webinar along with my colleague, Lisa Feldman from Energypedia. This webinar is a joint collaboration between three organizations, ICRC, Energypedia, and UNITA. And as you know, this webinar is actually part of a series of webinar on humanitarian energy nexus. And we do have a lot uh, past three webinars we talked about different issues within the humanitarian nexus, such as who are the actors involved in it, what was uh, how the solar inter projects or interventions have been made, or what was about um, interventions related to powering households and communities. I invite you to have a look at all of these old presentations or the videos. We have made a video for all the webinars, and we will also come up with uh, more webinars in January, so stay tuned. And also thank you to every one of you who took part in all of our last webinars and gave us your valuable suggestions. We will incorporate them in the upcoming webinar that will happen in January 2002. So 2020, not two. So I want to kickstart the webinar by just giving a small tip. On the right side of your screen, you should see a toolbox. If you don't see a toolbox, there should be an orange icon. Just click on that orange icon and it will expand into a toolbox. And there should be a section called as questions or chat. Please use this section and uh, send in all your questions. So um, what we will do is we will collect all your questions that comes for each of the presentation presenters during the presentation, compile them, and then send it to each of the presenter towards the end during the Q&A session. So it would be great if you could tell us to whom it is addressed. For example, question number one is addressed to presenter one or um, to speaker one. So that will help us to sort them out and send it to the respective speaker. And also before I kickstart the webinar, I also wanted to give a huge thanks to all our speakers for today because we have speakers from all over the globe who are, who are giving the experts opinion today, getting up early in the morning or staying late in the night. So we appreciate all of your experts' opinion. Thank you. And now it's about you, the audience. So thank you for joining us today. And let's know a little bit more about you. So what I will do is I will just launch a poll on your screen that says, where are you tuning in today from? So are you tuning in from Asia, Africa, Europe, Latin America? This is just to know where are our audience coming in for today. So I see a lot of questions are coming, uh, sorry, answers are coming in. So I'll leave it for, let's say, a few more seconds. And now I will close the poll and display the results. So as you can see on the screen, we have a lot of um, visitors coming in from a euro followed by Africa, Asia, Latin America, and welcome to all of you. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening, best on uh, wherever you are in the world. And now I want to, we want to know more about you. And that's why we have a second poll question popping up on your screen. And this is to just to understand which sector do you work in, either it's more energy related, humanitarian related, or research. So I can still see um, a lot of answers are coming in. So let's leave it for a few more seconds. So still, let's say four more seconds, four or five seconds. Superb. So let's say, because the answers are coming in, so thank you to all of you. So we'll leave it for another two more seconds. And now I can close the poll and then display the results. Superb. So today we have a lot of people who are joining in from others, which could be anything. And then we also have a lot joining in from humanitarian energy and followed by energy companies, sorry, research institute and energy companies. So one more time, welcome. And I hope this webinar will be useful to all of you. So I'll just quickly hide the, uh, close the poll and then get back to my screen. 
Superb. So that was to know a little bit about you, the audience. And now I want to quickly give you the agenda for today. So today we'll kickstart the webinar. We'll have a brief, um, like an outline of what, what a cooking intervention could look like, especially in a humanitarian setting. Then we have two experts presentation where they will share the experiences in Bangladesh and in Uganda. And finally, we have another presenter who is going to talk about the MECS cooking challenge, which you know later to us, um, later part of the presentation. And that will be followed by a Q&A session where, I, where, as I mentioned before, we will address all your questions that you have sent in via the chat box. So please use the chat box and send in as many questions as you want. And then I want to start the presentation by welcoming my first presenter for today, Krista Roth. Krista is the food and fuel consultant and has been working in the clean energy intervention for many years. And today she is going to give us like a brief overview on how a cooking intervention should look like or what are the key things that one should think about when planning a cooking problem. So we will try to get Krista on the line. So it seems like Krista is, so just to let our audience know, Krista is currently in Malawi and we are trying to, she's having some problem with the electricity problem at Malawi, so at, in Malawi. So we are hoping that she can tune in in another few minutes. So in that few minutes, we want to know more about you guys. So let's have another poll. So I would just launch another poll in your screen until we wait for Krista. So you should have a question popping up in your screen. And if you could tell us if you have been ever involved in a cooking interventions, that could be yes, I have been, or maybe you plan to get involved in this sector. So, so let's, uh, we have answers coming in. So, and in the meantime, so we have managed to also get Krista on the line. And we are still, sorry, we are still having a little bit of problem getting Krista on the line, but we will solve it till the polls come in. So we have to, we have left the poll for a few more minutes. And uh, in the meantime, we are trying to get Krista online. So in that case, since we are still struggling to get the Krista online, so maybe we can start with Modu's presentation. And if we manage to get Krista already in between online, then we can again uh, switch back to Krista. So first of all, let's close the poll and let's see how many people have answered. And I'll share the results. Sorry. Superb. So we have more than 38 person who are planning to do a, a planning a cooking intervention in the future. So we hope that you will be able to take many key points from this webinar and can use it uh, in your programs. So now I will switch to Modio's presentation. So um, let me quickly go back to my screen. Sorry, I'm quickly switching back to Modus part so that we can continue with Modus. So super. So we start with Modus presentation and a quick introduction to him. So Modus is currently working with the UN at CIA for the past one and a half years. And he has many years, more than six years of experience in the sector. And today he's going to talk about LPG interventions that was planned by UN at CIA. So Modu, I'm going to now unmute you so that you can join in the, pre uh, in the webinar. 
Um, Modu, if you could unmute yourself, you have muted yourself. Yes. Thank you, Ranisa. So, can I start now from uh, my slide? Yeah. Yes, yes, please. And you should be able to see the slides on the screen. Yes, that's great. Thank you again. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone from uh, Cox's Bazaar, Bangladesh. Uh, uh, good uh, morning, uh, good evening, depending upon your uh, location. Um, uh, in uh, and thank you again uh, to the organizer to organize um, uh, such a uh, online gathering where we will be able to present our activities and we will be able to share and learn a lot uh, from each other and uh, thank you uh, for the audience for your uh, thank you to the, all of the audience for your interest for your kind interest so in this presentation i would like to highlight uh, the cooking solution what we have brought uh, to the refugee camp here in coxe bazaar where about 1 million refugee populations are living since 2017. Uh, Rani, the next slide, please. As you know that here in Coxie Bazaar, the influx started uh, back in August 2017. And before this cooking fuel solution, what we have brought into the scene afterwards, before that, the population was dependent on the firewood only. So the photos, if you look into the photos on your left hand side at the top, marked with 2017, you can see that how green this part was before. But if you look into the picture uh, on your left hand side, but below, marked with 2018 you can see that how the greenery is turned into kind of desert like places it's happened mainly because of the shelter construction over that forestry that greeneries and also for the fuel wood collection for the cooking purpose for the way, from the very beginning, we address UNHCR address this issue and he started looking for the solution, the sustainable solution or the tangible solution of this problem. And we started the study on cooking from the very at the very beginning of that influx, and that study got published on December 2017. And from that study, we found that LPG would be the more cheaper and cleaner cooking options deep, uh, judging the context of the coxie bazaar areas means supply of other uh, cooking fuel the availability of other cooking fuel the cost and the environmental implication implications of other alternatives as well so based on that study we started a LPG pilot because the LPG has been found in that study, as I have said, that more cleaner and cheaper than other available cooking fuel options. And that LPG pilot, is start, we started with 6,000 LPG system distribution. LPG systems, here we mean that uh, the LPG cylinder along with the regulator, whose cook stoves, every of the things and it started in august 2018 and achieving the success of that lpg pilot we started the 100 percent rollout in november 2018 and here we have all already uh, able to distribute it 100 percent uh, to the 100 percent uh, refugee population the lpg and that 100 percent coverage finished in April 2019. And very recently, as a mandate of UNHCR, we have started distributing the LPG to the host community as well as a support to the host community. And we are targeting to uh, reach 
initially 20,000 families to the host community living surrounding in the camp, and then it might go up to 40,000. Next uh, slide, please, Rani, sir. At the same time, we are doing the monitoring and evaluation as well that how the LPG system is being used because you know that it is com it is completely a new system for many of the families for many of the people whom we have distributed lpg uh, through this program uh, we have interviewed many of them and uh, they have expressed themselves up that uh, they had not seen the lpg system before in their entire life uh, uh, before coming here in uh, this uh, refugee camp. So they were mostly dependent on the firewood for cooking and they used the traditional three stone stove before. But it's really amazing to learn from this monitoring, this continuous monitoring and evaluation, uh, what uh, we are doing that the adoption rate to this uh, new cooking fuel is very high and they have, they are, from the very beginning they have started using the lpg in a very efficient way so we have categorized the household in six different categories depending upon the family sizes and we distributed the lpg started distributing this lpg based on our uh, study and it was that uh, like that uh, we categorized that each family and each person needs to have approximately 82 grams of LPG per person per day. So based on that calculation, depend, uh, based on that study, we started distribution. But as the adoption rate to this system is very high, and we have found that uh, they actually started saving the LPG. And later, based on these uh, findings, we have recategorize uh, the refill cycle means now we are able to save at least seven percent of the lpg so the previous lpg distribution target was 10 lpg cylinder 12 kgs of cylinder per family per year now it uh, got down to 9.3 cylinder per family per year it means that we are now able to save 7% of the budget which is allocated for the LPG program. So per month, approximately the budget for the LPG is 1.15 million USD for the, solely for the LPG program. So 7% of the savings mean, means around 80,000 us dollar savings per month so it is really huge and it had only been possible thanks to the uh, population who are receiving uh, using the lpg in an efficient way thanks to them that we are able to achieve this success in a very short period of time next slide please In our monitoring and evaluation phase, we are observing and learning on uh, on daily basis the new things, and we are trying to adapt with the circumstances. Say, for example, on your left hand side, the photos you are seeing that the LPG uh, that hose pipe connecting from the LPG cylinder to the cookie stoves is wrapped up with a piece of cloth because we have found some of the families think that it might help to protect the hose from rodent but it is not the case actually it could turn uh, into a kind of uh, like uh, the issue for safety and security because that hanging part of the cloth might easily catch to the fire 
So that regular sensitization is also going on. We are sending the illuminators. We are engaged with the illuminators. The illuminators are knocking uh, the door almost every day, trying to get the feedback, how it is going on, if there is any feedback to improve the uh, program. And that's how we are trying to improve. And the right hand side, you see that uh, the, that picture that the clamp, which is the uh, like uh, is the connecting point in between the hose and the cookie stoves. It's very tiny um, uh, accessory, but the thing is that is very crucial. And we have found that uh, uh, we are working with several suppliers and the quality have not. Uh, they have not maintained the quality in an hundred up to the standard. So because of the low quality issue that uh, that type of particular camp is started getting to uh, is started to getting rust very quickly. And instead of coming to the distribution point, some of the families we have found, they try to fix this thing by themselves. And we have found in this particular instant that uh, that family tried to wrap the uh, hose with the cookie stops with a metallic wire. So this could also be turned into a deadly uh, occasions or scenario. Next slide, please. Rani uh, sir, next slide, please. Would you, um, Am I audible? You know, no, yes. Um, I already put in the next slide, so maybe because of the internet, it's loading slowly on yours. Um, can't you see the next slide? Okay. Uh, no, I'm not able to see the next slide yet. Okay. Let me try going back and then coming again. So maybe that will work. Okay, now it's uh, working. Now I'm able to see the next slide. Ah, okay, cool. Okay, thank you. So you can see that uh, we have found the uh, in few of the occasions the water inside the cylinder as well. Uh, you know that uh, it is a kind of common, uh, like uh, it's, it's not that rare practice in the in this sector. Uh, it might. Uh, um, happen because of mainly because of the two reason uh, because of it could uh, the reason could be the bad housekeeping of the LPG supplier from where we are getting the LPG and the another reason could be that uh, it has been done intentionally the investigations uh, is going on from both of uh, the site means supplier side as well as the hours as well as our site as well and uh, the thing is that this type of incident means water inside the cylinder is not at in that significant in rate like other occasions so it is still in our control and we have so far we have only found uh, 20 LPG cylinder filled up with uh, water. So the water content was like five, a range, the range was 500 gram to several kgs. So that uh, 20 water fill cylinder, if you compare with that 100,000 LPG cylinder, what already have been distributed, it is almost next to nothing. But we have taken this issue seriously and uh, the investigation is still going on. Can I have the next slide, please? So you know that the con camp context, it is very congested and the space is one of the obstacles here. So people are making, trying to make the sh uh, ships and uh, like for a few, uh, of the occasions we have found that uh, families are keeping the uh, cookie stoves on top of the shelf and above of it 
uh, you can find the another shelves and then another shelves which also increase the risk of uh, like uh, of catching fire at any moment but so far nothing has been uh, happened in the camp everything is uh, running smoothly and uh, for these type of occasions for not for uh, like encouraging the people the refugee populations to uh, like go by the uh, to go to follow the guidelines to follow the safe the guideline for safe use of the lpg system we are uh, continuously monitoring and the sensitization activity is going on on the photos on your uh, left the uh, like uh, bottom you can uh, see that how we are giving them the training as well the audio it includes the audio visual training and afterwards we also give them the fast hand uh, training as well the, we are giving them the demonstration before handing over the lpg system to them and the photos on your right you can see that after getting the receiving the training that how the peoples are adjusting themselves up. They are creating the mud guard. Uh, they uh, to uh, to kind of kind uh, to create a kind of barrier from the um, cookie stops uh, to the tarpaulin, so that at any worst case scenario, the fire would not uh, catch uh, to the shelter wall, to the tarpaulin or the bamboo wall so easily. So that's how the program is developing and to bring more sustainability into the scenario, we are now planning to go for uh, the pre-piloting of the pressure cooker. You know that the pressure cooker can save uh, 30, 40 to 50% of the fuel. And now we are targeting to achieve at least 30% saving of the fuel of pressure cooker intervention. So within next three to four weeks, we are uh, we are very much hopeful that we will be able to start that uh, uh, pre-piloting of the pressure cooker of distributing pressure cooker to 400 selected families. And after getting the lesson learned from uh, that 400 uh, uh, from that 400 users. We will next year. We are uh, we are planning to go for uh, the proper piloting of distributing the pressure cooker to 6,000 families. Then, if we are going to achieve the targeted uh, um, uh, savings uh, uh, point, then we will go for the 100% rollout of uh, uh, the pressure cooker intervention. That's how we are trying to improve our service to the. Uh, refugee population here in Bangladesh, bringing a sustainable cooking solution uh, to the scene. And hope in future it will uh, be going better and better and we will be able to uh, serve refugee uh, like uh, uh, to achieve the utmost instead, uh, standard while we are serving to the refugees. So with that hope, I would like to conclude here. Thank you all for your patience, Gary. Thank you, Morten. That was indeed a very comprehensive and nice overview into your program in Bangladesh. And I have been told that we have managed to get Krista on board. So I would now like to switch back to the first presentation so that we can hear from Krista. So my colleague Lisa, so she should. Yes. Un Hello. Yes, Krista. Yes, I will just go back to your first slides. Yes. So yes, so you can. Begin. Yeah, you can actually skip the first slide and go to the household energy needs. Yeah. Uh, Did you put the, the household energy needs on? Um. I don't so know. Yeah. It, it hasn't come through yet. So now I should have the household energy needs okay. in your screen. Exactly. Well, I don't have it in my screen yet, but I'll just talk to it because okay. some other places might be faster. Yes. Um, so, hello. Uh, sorry for the delay. Um, let's look at what household energy needs are there, in, especially in humanitarian settings. Uh, so that can put the cooking solutions and fuels in humanitarian settings into perspective. Um, most of the cooking, or let's say the household energy needs are actually going into thermal 
which is really vital for survival because we all need cooked food and not cooking is not an option because especially in humanitarian settings you cannot just go to a restaurant or go to the supermarket and buy some cooked food already if um, the rations from world food program that is the, um, the most um, frequent source of food and then you just need to deal with that and a lot of this is dry food and it's beans or other things that take a long time to uh, to cook and which are not digestible for the human body without being so much processed so here we are really talking the vital for survival thing and you can see by the size of these bubbles that uh, this is most of the energy normally over 80 percent of the household energy that is uh, used um, in humanitarian settings it's uh, translating to about one kilowatt uh, hour per person per day that has uh, is the result of several studies that have been done um, whereas if you look at uh, the other um, energy on the right hand side of that slide it's mostly electricity bound uh, for lighting, cooling, communication and so on, which add a lot to quality of life, but you can actually survive it or without a phone or without a radio. It's just that it's not so nice. Um, and if we look at the willingness to invest versus the um, needs of the requirements of energy, it's just the inverse. Um, nobody is really prepared to invest into cooking energy. Whereas everybody likes the sexy things about lighting, phone charging, radio, and whatsoever. And the orders of magnitude of the typical energy requirements, they are pretty shocking. Because if you look at a hot plate for cooking, the normal stuff that is out on the market is taking up something like 500 to 1,000 watt. Whereas if you look at one LED light, that's 1,000 times less. So if we want to cook on um, off-grid cooking, you're not winning with the normal um, devices. Whereas we can go towards like slow cookers that are on the market um, that start already like at 100 watts and they're definitely below 300 watts where we're going into a space where off-grid cooking can become, uh, off-grid electrical cooking can become a reality. Next slide. Um, what we definitely need to focus on is in any context, what is the priority? Because in humanitarian settings, there are so many priorities and you need to be able to choose between them or at least be aware of them that some of them have different solutions. So if you're in the environmental resource conservation uh, <clears throat> point of view, then like uh, Modo has just uh, pointed out, then you might have to go for a completely different fuel um, that is not depending on the environment uh, sources. If you're concerned with human health, be aware that in many cases, um, people are cooking outside the tents, but in some other places, people are cooking inside their, their housing, uh, in their shelters, uh, then you have different solutions to consider. Is it for protection that uh, you want to use the fuel gathering of the people um, so that they don't have to leave? Are you talking cost efficiency? Then first of all, for whom? Who pays for fuels and for stoves? Um, if it's the agency that pays, you have to consider procurement, the transport, the logistics, the distribution of both stoves and fuels. Or if it's the user that pays for things, then you need to consider the affordability of the livelihoods of the people. How does that fit in? What are the solutions that are feasible? And next slide, please. Um, any solution that you're coming up with has to have the user in the center because very often people just focus on what is in between these purple lines, the stove. But that stove is in a context and it's operated by somebody and it's highly dependent on the food that has to be cooked, the fuel that is available, the stove has to go with the fuel. We all know that if you have an LPG stove, um, you cannot put firewood in there, but some people tend to forget these things. Um, if we're talking 
human health, anything ventilation or exposure related will have an impact on the cooking systems. But in general, if the intervention does not suit the user, there will be no impact. The stove used does not give you any impact. Next slide, please. So if we want to design user-centered uh, cooking solutions, well, we actually have to start with the fuel. Guess why? Because the stove follows the fuel. So there are different things that we can do. You see increased access to clean fuels, and I put the clean fuels in quotation marks. There are no clean fuels. A clean fuel is maybe something that has been processed and refined, so it has an opportunity to burn cleaner than other things that haven't been refined. But it's not in the fuel itself that it is burning and completely. It should increase our chances with higher levels of refinement. But normally, we summarize these so-called clean fuels as the bleens, biogas, LPG, electricity, ethanol, and natural gas. Um, that is not so feasible and realistic in uh, humanitarian settings, because all these things, they are not locally found. You would need to create the supply chains. So. What people very often do is they just go outside the camp and raid whatever biomass they can find. Um, but we can also make that cleaner if we're concerned about uh, human health. Um, we can improve the combustion by preparing that fuel a little better. That can be just by drying the fuel, not going out every day and then sticking wet firewood into some stove. But we can dry it out, we can size it, uh, we can make it fit to the appropriate stoves. And then, of course, we can um, increase the ventilation or just make a sensitization for people that whatever comes out of the stove is not necessarily what goes in the nose and the human system. If we cook in the open or if we have better ventilation in the spaces where we are cooking. So as I said, in that um, um, in the in the picture, you can see that the user is in the center, and there are different types of fuels. And I've actually put out this thing as an energy shelf. You might have heard about the energy ladder, but it's really more a shelf because the user decides which fuel is available, which stove can do the preparation of the fuel, uh, of the food that we have to do in a good way. And parallel usage of multiple fuels and devices is the norm. And it's also a desired uh, situation by the people because not everything cooks the same way or roasts the same way. If at all, we look at environmental and climate focus, go on renewable fuels, that they are marked in green here, and sustainable biomass production because Guess what? Biomass is sustainable if you make it renewable and manage it well. Let's look at a quick decision process. You will get these slides later on, so you can go through and through and through. And uh, you can also find more explanation in publications or Stoves 101 presentation that I've done somewhere else. But next slide, is it there? Quick decision processes on user-centered cooking solutions. The first thing is, any decision on type and brand of device comes last, after the assessment of the needs. Don't start with, oh, this stove could, looks cool, let's do this. Hmm. Start with the fuel, what is available, where, is it suitable for the cooking task, what fuels is the target group familiar with. We just heard about LPG challenges that if people are not familiar with LPGs, it will be very hard for them to become familiar with. But if you have a, a fuel that is already known to the ta or at least part of the target group, then it's a lot easier to introduce the fuel and the stove to go with. And you can also ask people what would their preferred cooking fuel be. Asking doesn't harm. If it's possible, that will be found out. But the more the target group is involved, the more the solutions suit the users, the better chances of adaptation you have. Next slide, please. 
because otherwise you end up with this situation that everybody says, oh yeah, solar cookers, they are really great technologies. Well, they are, but they're very impractical because you can't cook breakfast, you can't cook dinner, and it's not very suitable to roasting meat or something else like that. And so it depends really on what people are cooking, what are the food rations, that is very, very context specific. And otherwise you end up with this, we use the soda cooker as an icebreaker because everybody gets, gets excited and they stop by to chat, but it's not used for the intended purpose of cooking, right? Um, next slide. So if we're looking at the energy from solid biomass, there's nothing wrong with biomass as long as it is coming from a sustainable source, which in humanitarian settings, to be honest, becomes a challenge. But it's not that we have to just really phase out biomass by force. We can as well start looking at it in a, in a way that we do something about the availability. Because biomass energy is solar energy stored by a plant. So the biomass is actually our battery. It's renewable and climate neutral. If we've managed the sources well, it's available on demand. It's not like you have a blackout and then you can't do anything about it, but you can make your own storage of uh, the um, firewood safe and easy to store, no disposal in issues, it cannot explode, and it has got a reasonably high calorific value as long as it is dry. So next slide. If we compare the um, cooking fuel choices that we have, uh, things that you need to consider is the bulk volume, calorific values, the state, is it solid, liquid or gaseous? What do I need to transport? Uh, what are the costs of procurement? How are my distributions going? For example, if I choose a liquid fuel, I need a different type. Either I need packaging or I need a tanker for liquid. I cannot just put things on somehow a truck. If I'm considering gas, I have to also consider that my gas is only not even half of the weight, but I need to transport the empty cylinders as well or I need to have a refueling station, a refilling station somewhere hand, handy. So biomass, it's firewood is actually not bad comparing into bulk volumes and calorific values if I'm comparing it with other fuels. Let's go next slide on continuing our decision process. The cooking needs come after the fuel. Who needs to cook what and how? That depends on the type of food, so often depending on the food rents, the cooking time, the duration of cooking, the type of cooking, if people have to do boiling, roasting, baking, the heat type required, do I need to adjust heat, do I need low heat, high heat, how big is my turn down ratio that I need, and very, very important, the shape and the type of the cooking vessel. That very often depends on UNHCR giving out um, the parts, but it also depends on culture. You see in the photo there, that is the Somali injera, um, very common in the Eastern Ethiopian refugee camps. And that is a little um, like a, a wok size pan. Then um, that needs to fit on the stove and it needs to be handled by a stove. So very often, if you have a stove, it has got like a skirt around it, you cannot use that Somali injera, then people will not use um, the stoves and then you find the stoves upside down on a roof ten, uh, roof as protecting the roof so let's look at different types of um, solid biomass fuels next slide please um, that you can categorize by substance and shape it's either uncarbonized naturally found fuels or the carbonized and then that's the shape anything log shape that you can push from the side can go as in any stove that is designed for firewood stove, whereas anything else that is smaller size or carbonized has to have special types of stove. Charcoal stoves are very um, known in many places, but the process of making charcoal is very wasteful. Um, so it's better to use uncarbonized fuel. You need to have the fuel and the stove both available so very often that is not feasible in a humanitarian setting. Next slide. Um, if we now cook, look at the cooking environment, where do people cook? Next slide, please. We have a lot of factors and that are 
influencing the human health and the so-called clean cooking energy systems. But it, there are many factors that influence that. It's the stove, the type of choice and uh, of stove and the techniques, how to prepare the fuel if it's moist fuel, the stove will smoke, even if it's a so-called clean stove. The user behavior is important if you have the, the people leaving the kitchen, cooking outside, and in the ventilation, all the air exchanges um, matter. If you have cross ventilation, if you have openings, all these things matter and not only the stove. Next slide, please. So we add another um, layer, the size and the type of device to our decision-making process. Like what are the pots? What are the pot sizes? Which type of, of operation uh, people do need and would be what is acceptable? Like, again, I'm sticking with this uh, Somali injera plate. If that does not fit on a stove, that stove will not be used. And then we just have um, unused stove. In general, next slide, please. We need to give users appropriate options. Not only what we think they need, but what they need and what they want so that they are likely to use it regularly. Because again, a stove not used has no impact. So the top line that you see here is an example from Tanzania. It's the same basic stove body, but it has, um, it's, it comes in different forms. One is just installed in mud. The other one is as a standalone thing. It can be used as for, with firewood and with charcoal because it's got a little grate there. And then we have the more high-end version of it uh, that comes in a metal cladding. And that is more for, the, for urban populations or where you have to transport the stoves for a longer distance. And give people options. If people want a pink stove or a purple stove or a green stove, give it to them. Have them choose what they want. So we come to summarizing. Um, next slide, please. This is really just for you a checklist on going through. And now the last thing is brand selection. And there you have also a list of stakeholders with whom you should be consulting. And now next slide, how to select a brand now. You've done all your homework on what needs to be done, what would be um, suitable for the people, and now you can go on that clean um, cooking catalog and you can then select a brand based on performance, based on um, availability, on cost and whatsoever, right? But brand selection comes last. Don't choose a stove. Oh, this is going to be a great stove. No. First look at what is needed. So there is again, next slide please, a recap on decision making for cooking. Then you can uh, go through also what is what would you need in the short term, what would be a suitable energy mix and an immediate least cost energy mix um, and where would you maybe transition into uh, in the long and medium term to address cooking energy security. And then next slide, last not least, some things to just go through, keep in mind, are we talking free distributions? Are we talking market-based approaches? Like for example, in situations of projected crisis in one location or what is it? Context matters. And again, cooking energy starts with the fuel. Where does it come from? Can you grow something? Can you bring it through markets? Um, and then there will be a lot of other question marks that will come up in the context when you're analyzing it. But one piece of advice, get expertise before wasting resources, your time or money or anybody else's patience. There are a lot of experts out there and some of the experts are presenting here as well. That's just what I can do to close up and thank you very much. Thank you, Krista. I'm pretty sure there could not have been a better overview than this, and especially the decision diagrams that you showed would be helpful to all of our listeners. I know you have to leave early, so I will quickly address one question that came in during your presentation. So the question is, can an organization can... So what do you think an organization can focus on conservation, human health, protection and cost efficiency 
or is it better better for an organization to just take one of the areas and just focus on one topic? Krista? I'm saying you have to first analyze what is it that you think you want? What is it that the target group thinks they want? And you will have probably conflicting um, uh, priorities and then you just have to have a discussion process within your organization what is it that you want because to be honest clean cooking is not on the highest point of priority so if you as an organization go in and say I want clean cooking first define what clean cooking means to you and then mm, check out what is it actually the priorities of the host community of the target community and then find a solution where everybody can be happy Superb. Then I just have one more question that about the slide, uh, second slides that you were talking about, where it said that um, there is usually less willingness to pay for cooking solutions as compared to others, uh, like for example, lightning maybe. Is it because of sort of the gendered component to it? Because cooking is mostly done by women who have who tend to mostly have less decision decision making power. You nailed it. That is <laughs> quite true because um, I call the, the cooking energy the female energy, but it's the male who holds the cash. So he'd rather have a radio or a phone or whatsoever, and ah, that's just women's stuff, you know. She can manage. Yeah, that's unfortunately the truth. Superb. So since um, I know you have to leave and we will just end the Q&A session for your part right now, and I would like to move to um, another presenter for today. So. Now let me just move forward in my slides. And thank you, Krista. Yeah, okay, welcome. Sorry. So now I would like to invite our third presenter for today, and that's Vahid Zahangiri from International Lifeline Fund. Vahid has been associated with Lifeline since 2006, and he has planned and implemented many cooking programs in countries like Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, and so on. And today, Vahid is going to share his experiences from Uganda. Vahid, the floor is yours. So I'll now quickly unmute you so that you can uh, go ahead with the presentation. Great. Uh, greetings to everyone. Thank you so much for making the time to be a part of this webinar today. Uh, I'm Vahid Jahangiri with the International Lifeline Fund, and today I will be presenting a, a project that we recently completed in Uganda. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, our organization, it's a U.S.-based organization who has been implementing projects in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and Haiti since 2006. And we have been uh, involved in R&D, in design, in implementation, in setting up production and manufacturing facilities, training, and also monitoring evaluation. Historically, when we came to this uh, space, our main goal was to address the needs in the emergency context or in conflict uh, con situations. But as uh, the sector has evolved over the years, as we have uh, gone through a lot of learning ourselves, we decided to be able to also to tweak our mission a bit and also be able to bridge the historical gaps in these both spaces of water and energy, not just as an implementing agency, but also as a thought partner and to be able to help other organizations to be able to have more successful programs on the ground. Uh, next slide, please. So today's uh, presentation is about a project that we did in Uganda and uh, I'm not sure, maybe some of you may not be familiar with the context in Uganda in the recent years, but there has been an influx of refugees for over 1 million that have been coming from South Sudan, from Congo and elsewhere, which has uh, created a very difficult situation, especially negative impacts on the environment and also increasing conflict with the host community in some of the areas. So we wanted to create, design a program essentially to see how we can address different aspects of the context on the ground. And in designing our programs, we also don't want to look at just the immediate terms, but what can we do together with the community and with the local government and all the stakeholders to be able to plant the seeds and build the foundational aspects of a project that can actually 
have a much more impact in the long term. So within this project, we wanted to look at increasing livelihood and resilience, and at the same time, be able to reduce biomass dependency, and at the same time, to look at how we can develop the community asset to be leveraged for long-term economic growth. And in the process of this, what were the possibilities to also nurture markets and create demand for energy, affordable, uh, affordable energy products in order to reduce this dependency on biomass and be able to create better livelihoods and jobs for the people in these different locations in Uganda. And also in this process, one thing that is also important for us is also to look at the psychosocial aspect of, of what is happening on the ground. Essentially, many, many people who come to these refugee camps are women and girls. And it was very important for us to design our program in such a way that is just not us giving out a gadget, but also there is a process where we can also have a positive impact in the psychosocial uh, aspect of the program. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the target uh, uh, location in Uganda was basically five areas. Uh, which three of them were the refugee settlements along with the host communities in those areas. And there were also two other districts in the Karamoja region, which is the northeastern part of Uganda, which has faced drought for many, many years and is uh, one of the poorest locations uh, of Uganda. Um, uh, and uh, so we wanted to make sure that we are not just targeting refugees, but we are also targeting the host community and also other areas where it's not necessarily a refugee area, but where our program can also have an impact uh, in these locations. Next slide, please. Now, I, I don't expect you to read all of this, but I wanted to just give you a quick overview about what was delivered in this project in, a, in about a six to seven months period. Within this project, we uh, for sure were targeting the households and also the institutions, the schools, because the schools is definitely an area where you have a significant amount of uh, biomass that is being used by schools on everyday basis. So to, to design a program that was, uh, was not just on for the household level, but also at the institutional level, where you can also address these other areas uh, uh, within these locations. At the same time, we were had a very, very, uh, we were able to build a very close relationship with all the district level government uh, agencies in order for them to really be a part of the process. Because if they're not part of the process, then the ownership in the long term may not be there. In addition, we built energy kiosks, and these energy kiosks, the main goal of these energy kiosks was uh, to see if we can, in fact, build markets and for the products actually to, to have demand and to have adoption. Uh, because if you just go out and you just give out 2,000, 3,000 stoves, and, and that, that may not, that, that's not going to really be effective in the long term. And of course, to see uh, how we could increase the consumer demand in regards to to the to the awareness of you know deforestation and also uh, their their energy needs. Uh, next slide. Now, what I really like to focus actually this presentation on is on the learnings, on the successes, and also the challenges and what we learned. So this can be something useful also for your programs that you're doing or you're planning to do. Uh, next slide, please. So the first thing in our in any kind of project, and also in this respect to this project, was really focusing on building trust with the communities and with everybody who's involved in these uh, areas, including the local government. Now, what's really important is that when you start these type of projects, you really have to understand who is the community? What do they exactly need? What is their culture? What is the dynamics of the local leadership and the stakeholders? And what is the communication ladder among all of these stakeholders in these various uh, refugee settlements or the host communities? Because if, if you cannot build this trust, it will be very difficult for the project in the long term to be to have a sense of to have a, to have ownership. 
and it will it will undermine everything you're doing. So it wouldn't matter if you have the best stove or if you have the best cook best cooking solution. This trust component is a, is a very very important aspect of any kind of a program, and I cannot put enough emphasis on this. Now, once you have this trust, this is where you can really see who are the local ambassadors, who are your local champions, or you're the superheroes that can help you with a project. Because these are the people who are in the community, who understand the dynamics, who know where, what resources are available, and they, we will be great, let's say, ambassadors to be able to mobilize people and to increase ownership of the project in the long term. Next slide, please. The next thing is really on the technology, which Krista mentioned some of the key important points when you are uh, planning to do a project like this. For us, we already have been working in Uganda for a very long time. So we had a very good understanding of the context and the cooking habits and the cooking cultures. And given that we had worked with the South Sudanese and the Congolese populations before, we already had a very good idea about what is it that they really need and how do they go about preparing their food what's important is that the technology must work because if the technology does not work there will be no adoption in regardless of how much we think uh, a particular technology can have high efficiency or or it's clean or it makes a lot of sense for it let's say in a laboratory but reality is the field the technology has to work at the field level and cooking culture in every country is very, very different. Uh, as we cannot go to Italy and tell the Italian people to cook their pasta in a microwave, we still we also cannot go to a particular uh, culture and tell them to completely change their cooking habits. It's just not reality. So we look at fit, we look at form, we look at function before uh, we decide to deploy a particular technology uh, to the field. Now, what's important for you to know is that if you're deciding to uh, have a cook stove uh, implement, I mean, uh, program, you really also want to make sure that that particular technology has had some kind of a track record and it was actually tested at, at the field level. Because if it was not tested at the field level, then the probability of failure can be very, very, can be very high. And we have seen this over and over in at least 10 countries in this past 13 years. With our program, because we already had this deep knowledge of the cooking culture, we had adoption of 97%. And um, so that's, that's, uh, that's, where you, that's, that's where you want to be. Uh, next slide, please. Now, if you don't have a good, if you don't have the right technology, as you can see in, this, in these photos, you either will end up with a solar cooker graveyard, and that photo is from the Dove refugee camp, or you will have your your stove to be sold as a scrap metal or as you can see in the picture to the left it will be put on the top of a hut to protect from the rain or to, to be used as a chimney and that's a brand new stove that was given to a refugee household in ethiopia actually this is not what we want to see what we want to see in our successful projects but this is why context analysis and understanding who ultimately the user is and who the community is, it's extremely important. Next slide, please. Another very, very important that led to success of our project in Uganda or for any program, uh, wherever you, you work, is training. But how do you go about training is extremely important. Training, not in a way that we just go with a clipboard and, 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 and expect that people are going to understand what we are telling them. People have different educational backgrounds. People uh, just like us have different learning curves. So for, 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 you, for us to have a very, let's say, successful project, we need to make the training very creative. People need to see actually visually that the stove can cook the food that they prepare on daily basis. So if you are in Uganda, maybe you're making posho and beans, or you're Kenya, you're making ugali, or if you're in Congo, you're making fufu, or if you're in Haiti, you're making maybe rice and beans. But people need to see that the stove can perform boiling or simmering or making stews or even barbecuing. So we spent a lot of, lot of time and energy 
in creating the training in such way that people are very, very focused. So a lot of times in the training sessions, we don't have 100 people or 200 people. Maybe we have only 20 or 25 people. Now, it takes much longer time from implementation point of view, but it will definitely contribute to a much higher success rate for your programs. And this was definitely, I would say, an element that really contributed to the adoption of the 97%. Uh, next slide, please. Now, if the technology is right, and if the training is right, it will have an impact on gender. In, the, in our case, in Karamoja, which is a very, very difficult place to have any sort of adoption given the context on the ground, the men saw the value in the stove and the men took the interest to actually even start cooking, as you can see in these photos. This is something actually that we had never seen before, uh, at least in Uganda. And this was a very, very positive indicator for us that the more we have people involved in the process, the more we can reach our goals. So this again goes back in the way we communicate, in the way we share the information, in the way people can actually see something can work and he has a value in their lives, whether they're men or women, it doesn't matter. And to have men involved in this process makes a lot of difference and it makes it a lot easier for women to be able to make decisions regarding what kind of a cooking uh, technologies that they need. Next slide, please. Now, this comment uh, was not for, for, for this particular project, but as you can read, a donor came back to us and in 2017, this is before we actually implemented this project, and told us, well, ILF, you know, you guys are great. You have a great technology on the ground. But we go out to the camps and we see stoves that are either in some storage collecting dust that are your stoves, or people are not using your stoves. So this tells us whoever purchased the stove from you did not conduct the training for them. And this is very true. And this is really a message to the donors, actually. We cannot fund programs without training. We cannot just fund gadgets. It, it, it's very, very difficult to provide these technologies and not provide training and expect that we're going to be successful. And um, so this is very important. And we want to make sure that in any kind of a, a technology deployment, we include training as as a requirement not as an option uh, next slide please one of the another very important aspect of any time that you are uh, implementing this type of a, or any kind of a program i'll say in general is to have continuous monitoring on the ground this monitoring the way we go about our monitoring is that after we distribute the stores with training we do basically a three-phase monitoring. We do a training one or two weeks after people have received their stoves. Then we do another monitoring after one month, after three months, and after six months. Each phases of this monitoring gives you a lot of information and also enables you to tweak your project if it's needed and if you have to make any, any kind of a course correction. In our case, what happened was in one of the locations, we learned through our monitoring that the people were not using the stoves. Then we learned that the, actually the people that were coming to the training were not the real users of the stoves. They were just the other people in the household who were not even involved in cooking or they were neighbors. But we were able to uh, do a course correction and going back to the community and retraining the you know, the people that were actually responsible for cooking and be able to rectify that issue. The point here is that it's not just we just go out and give a stop and do a training and we say goodbye and think that everything's going to be okay. We need to continuously, as our UNHCR colleague mentioned earlier, to monitor our project during the implementation to make sure that there is the level of adoption or if there's any questions that we need to address, we'll be able to help the users with. Next slide, please. Um, Bahit, yes. we are over time, is it possible to wrap in the next one or two minutes? Yes, 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 yes. Thank you. Um, yeah, you can actually go to the next slide. 
the one other thing is very important that we have seen over the years that one stove is never enough. We ourselves have a lot of cooking appliances, therefore it's very necessary that we also, if we really wanted to address, let's say deforestation, one stove is just not really going to address what we are think that we can achieve by providing just one technology. Uh, next slide, please. This, uh, uh, the last thing that I'd like to mention is that if you do have success from your technology and your training, then you can have early impact, which, which in our case was very visible. And that really helped to build more trust with the community and also to be able, be able to put the foundational elements to, have, to be able to have a scale up in, in future. And the last, uh, just one more slide, please, and I'll and wrap up here. And uh, this slide is very important because this is really the bridge that we have to make from, let's say, free distribution and to creating markets. And there's, I mean, this is on its own, is a webinar on its own, but it's possible and we were able to do this and it's all about the methodology that you need to have to make sure that this can be a success. And I can finish here. The last two slides are just more informational slides that you can read at a later time. Thank you, Vahid, for that excellent overview. Um, really, it was such a great insight for us. And as I promised, we will share the presentation later so you can have a look and read all the information from there. And I guess the all the three presentations, one point that they all highlighted is this bottom-up approach. And thank you for that. And now I have the next presenter, Ann, who is working as the Humanitarian International Liaison Manager for the MECS program. And today she's going to quickly introduce the MECS Cooking Challenge. Ann, you should now be unmuted. Thanks, Renisha. Good day, everyone. Thank you to my fellow presenters for setting the context and sharing the successful examples and lessons learned from cooking in the humanitarian settings. I am Ann and I'm from the MEX program based at Loughborough University in the UK. Today I'll be introducing the MEX program and encouraging listeners to apply for the Challenge Fund competition that will be launching in December. Next slide, please. So to begin with, I just want to start by highlighting that currently the SDG 7 target of clean cooking is probably one of the least likely targets that's going to be achieved. So in that sense, we are looking for ways that we can reverse that situation in which business as usual will not be enough. So for the four, past 40 years, the dominant policy of cooking energy has been centered on improving combustion efficiency for biomass. Um, next slide, please. But times are changing, really. Previous research by our team in 2013 noticed some really interesting trends in the energy sector. Firstly, we see that the price of solar panels have been decreasing, as well as the price of batteries, and they are coming down. But in contrast, what we can see is the price of charcoal has been increasing, and this creates an environment to suggest that there is an alternative narrative to the cooking story in the developing and humanitarian settings. Next slide, please. So last year, the Modern Energy Cooking Service Program, or MEX for short, was launched. So MEX is a DFED funded program over five years with activities that fundamentally try to rethink the way we approach clean cooking globally. But what we mean by modern energy is the transition from biomass to clean cooking using either gas or electricity. Next slide, please. So this is a really busy slide, but I want to highlight that we have five main activities to the MEX program. So the first activity is actually tracking where we are in terms of the current provisions of clean cooking and how we trace, how we best get there. And we need to be particularly focused on the role of new entries into the sector and how they best can be promoted. And this includes systematic review of literature led by ESMAP and um, e-cooking research led within the team, the MEX team. Um, secondly, we have uh, activities where the area of technology and other form of innovation are promoted. There are two parts of this really. One is the program activities that are led by the universities consortium based in the UK, in Africa and Asia. And these activities involve anything from prototyping through to research on different forms of energy storage, 
through how they can best, best fit in a solar home system, service mini grids or national grids. We also have specific streams looking at humanitarian host communities, um, institutional cooking and pre-cooked foods. The second part of this second stream is looking at the £7.5 million pound challenge fund. We've already funded 28 different companies. I'll be giving you more information about how you can apply for this funding in my last slide. The third area is reviewing the global tracking framework and looking at how we cover cooking at the moment. We're working with ESMAP to develop a multi-tier framework around cooking services. The fourth area that we're looking at is how we take all this work to scale and through partnerships through the World Bank and other um, large organisations and funding bodies. And finally, to the MEX program, we are working with our global partners to transform and challenge, really, the narrative of clean cooking. An example of this would be the formation of a high-level route um, through raising the profile of clean cooking on a global scale, including at the UNHCR Global Refugee Forum to be held in Geneva in December. The next slide, please. So this is the slide everybody's been waiting for. Uh, we would love to encourage as many of you to apply for our challenge fund competition. We've already ran two previous challenges. The first one was to support private sectors with R&D on efficiency for access. And the second challenge fund was on technology research for international development. So this third one we're looking at is funding electric cooking outreach, and it will focus on electric efficient cooking appliances in any context, including humanitarian. We are very keen to encourage community scale pilot studies and also looking at market assessments to gather intelligence on opportunities emerging in different priority countries for efficient electric cooking appliances. The call will be launched in, on the 11th of December and if you pre-register, you'll be first to know when it's launched. So it will be open for six weeks. What we really hope to see is as many proposals as possible. So thank you, Renisha. Thank you, Anne. Thank you for the short overview. And let me just go to the slides. Yeah. So, yeah, um, reiterating Anne's message. So, if you're interested, please check out the link to the MECS challenge and do apply for it. And now we come to the QA sessions, all of the amazing questions that you have been sending in. So, I want to maybe start with Modu. And so, the first question that came for you, Modu, is so we talked about the LPG package. How much do the households have to pay for getting the basic LPG package, which would include the cylinder and the stove? And how much do they pay for refilling the cylinder? Um, could you unmute yourself, Modur? Uh, thank you. Am I audible now? Yes. Anissa? Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, the first First of all, I would like to clarify the thing is that uh, refugee need not to uh, pay uh, uh, pay anything for to get these services. Uh, UNHCR is uh, uh, like spending the budget uh, to to uh, get these services to the refugee uh, uh, in kind assistance as in kind assistance, um, but on like cost. Be, uh, if we would like to highlight on the cost, so UNHCR is spending uh, on an average uh, 11 to 12 US dollar per cylinder to get it refilled each time. So it is the 12 kgs of cylinder and we are working with several of suppliers. So there is a price range variation as well. So the each of the refill is costing us 11 to 12 dollars us dollars and for the whole new packages at the beginning uh, including the audio visual training and other parts like uh, new cylinder at the beginning along with the cookie stove stoves uh, with the hose and regulator uh, the cost range was about uh, 40 to 45 us dollars 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, there was also a follow-up question to this. So you mentioned this refuge you do not have to pay, but in case you were to establish a market for have you also looked into it if there is a willingness from the refugee itself to pay for such a system instead of getting, um, let's say, uh, not having to pay for it? Because it's an expensive system, as you rightly mentioned. Yes, thank you. Thank you for this uh, follow-up question. The thing is that here the, in every of the refugee contexts, uh, actually this type of decision and uh, this type of intervention depends upon the context actually. Here in Bangladesh, what is happening that uh, like from the host government decision, we can't actually or refugee can't even uh, like go for or can express their willingness to uh, go for uh, buying or uh, to do something like that because they are not allowed to involve in livelihood activities. So like in clear terms, there is no income generation activities for them as well. So this one part. And uh, the, second, the second thing is that, yes, we interviewed before this intervention, uh, before starting this intervention, that if the situation uh, changes, then what could be the other uh, like next phases? So in that, uh, study we have found in that before LPG interventions actually many of the families were spending on an average 10 to 12 US dollar per month they were managing it to uh, like to they are managing to have this amount of money somehow doing like voluntary activities or other sort of activities and they were spending on an average 10 to 12 US dollar per month for their cooking fuel, buying uh, uh, firewood from the market and other uh, from or uh, collecting food from the uh, wood from the host community population. So on an average, if you just compare that their previous spending for few of the families, the 10 to 12 dollars and the LPG refueling cost is also uh, like approximately the same. So when, if, and when the situation and context will be changed, then we will be able to start think about that. But right now it is not happening and it's not on the horizon. Thank, Super. You. Thank you for the uh, answer. So now I want to move to Vahid and there I have um, a two part question. So the question to Vahid is, we talked about in yours and both in Krista's presentation, the need to address the cooking habit of the population. So the two, the first question is, do you see an opportunity to change cooking, um, the current cooking habit, so that you can change it more towards more sustainable and cleaner solutions? And second is, if yes, have you ever had any such interventions and could share from your experience? So Vaid, I'm gonna quickly unmute you. So yeah, now you can answer. Yes. Well, I, I, we, we have never seen a situation where we have been able to change cooking habits. Uh, I think that's very difficult. Now, there is a possibility with it. With, it, it goes back to training. If potentially the technology can uh, convince the user that they can maybe tweak their habits a bit, then there is a possibility there. But overall, cooking habits have been there for thousands of years. It's, it's very difficult to tell somebody, for example, to change the way they're making uh, ugali or they're making some kind of a porridge. Uh, I, think, I think that's very difficult to do. Uh, but there could be, potentially, there could be some ways, uh, depending, again, what the technology is and how it's being introduced. Definitely. Thank you so much. And I also had one more question to you itself is, um, I mean, Mo, Mo, Modur, you can also jump in on this question. It's addressed to all the speakers. So the question is, um, how likely is it to get a reforestation project connected to the needs of a refugee camp? And in this, um, so I'm thinking about lack of space regulations. So, and so that's what the, um, the user explained as what could be the issues. So the question is, how likely is it to get a refor reforestation project connected to the needs of a refugee camp? Uh, okay, uh, if I may, uh, to uh, take this question from my uh, side. Uh, so uh, uh, from the beginning of this uh, particular LPG intervention project, uh, 
these energy and environment units uh, have already uh, like started uh, for the plantation activities as well. So as I have showed you the picture that how greenery uh, the situation was just one or, one or two years ago. But after the LPG intervention, we are seeing that because of our environmental intervention as well that plantation activities and other sort of uh, like uh, like sensitization activities for uh, like conservation activities so the the greeneries are coming out so now uh, at this stage we are planning to take that kind of another uh, drone image at the same time when we took that those drone images uh, before so it will be able to help all of us to get the understanding that how it is going hand in hand all together. And if I uh, like, if I would like to uh, like highlight uh, on that particular point that before LPG intervention, like uh, on an average, 1,000 metric tons of firewood was was being burned every day. So if you just compare it, uh, like it was all about the three to five football field size of forest was being disappeared almost every day. So now it's all stopped. And with along with that reforestation activities, the plantation activities, the conservation activities, what UNSCRs have already started. So the greeneries are coming back. So it is happening uh, at the same time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Vai, do you want to add something to that? No, I, I think uh, I think it's it's sufficient. Super. Then I would just ask one more question to both of you. And actually, it's a question to all the um, all the speakers. So feel free to jump in. So the question is: We all talked about this bottom-off approach for clean cooking interventions. With that respect, how important do you think is it? collaborate with local NGOs who are actually operating on the ground so that you can get this bottom-up approach. Um, anyone want to take this question? Sure, I can take this question. Well, it's extremely important. Uh, I mean, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation that we need to work with all the stakeholder, stakeholders, so definitely community-based organizations, women groups, youth groups, whoever's, whoever's in the community, they have to be involved in the process and they can help you with this. They have a, they know that they know where the resources are. They know the dynamics on the ground. Therefore, their role is extremely critical uh, in these type of projects or any kind of a project. Thank you, Vaid. Um, then I have one more question again that's addressed to all of the speakers. So we talked about stoves, we talk about cooking apply um, so intervention and so on. But what happens to the stoves towards the end of its lifetime? How do you make sure that they um, like there is sustainable recycle or what happens to the towards the end of their lifetime? Sure. Would you like me to tell me? Oh, that doesn't matter. I mean, sure, go ahead, um, and then I can ask more, but uh, more deal after that. Well, first of all, it really depends what kind of a stove it is. But let's say, but if you actually design your program in a way that you can set up a repair system or a maintenance system for it then it will not be a problem the stove can all can always work for a very very long time but definitely in the refugee areas there's been a huge case of uh, durability issues where the stoves are pretty much dead after one year a lot of this again comes down on the way you design your program and the way you choose your technology then you will be able to address that uh, but if you choose something that is only good for six months then yeah there's a problem and no one's ever going to fix that stove so it really goes back goes back to the way you design your project and then you'll be able to address that. Definitely, I think that's the key mantra for today. Um, Modu, do you want to add something to that? Uh, thank you. I think uh, Vahid have uh, uh, covered it very, uh, in a very nice way and uh, that's what we are actually doing here. Uh, like we have already set up the like repair shop at each of the distribution point and uh, all of the cookie stoves what has been delivered has come up with uh, like warranty period mm -hmm. and uh, at the same time uh, we are uh, looking forward and have already started uh, uh, like uh, to think about that 
uh, to extend the durability of the cookie strokes and uh, now we are now planning to go for like uh, higher high efficient cookie strokes uh, which uh, with which we might get uh, the warranty coverage more than five to eight years and which are available in the market not in the local market but in the market like uh, in the neighboring country like india so now these things is are in planning stage and we are trying to develop uh, this uh, with these particular issues uh, more and more thank you thank you it's good to hear that you are planning such sustainable um, out uh, solutions and now since we are coming towards the end of the presentation as our end of the webinar i would like to move to my final slides um so first of all as you can see on the screen so first of all let's close the q a session and a um, thank you to all the speakers and all the all the users uh, sorry attendees for sending us amazing uh, questions and for our experts to give us and their expert opinions and answers and now as you can see on the screen i have the final thank you slide so before you leave the webinar as you can see you can always send us feedback at info at energypedia.info so if you have anything that you like didn't dislike or thought we could improve about the webinar please do send us your feedback additionally when you close the webinar a survey will pop up and there you have the against the chance to give us your feedback and we highly encourage you to do that because whatever feedback that you give us, we actually feed that into our future webinars. So it actually helps us to really make the webinar tailored to your needs. And you can also see our documentation link where you can find all the webinar material from today that includes the presentation slides, the audio, sorry, the video recording and so on. And it should be online um, uh, to, by tomorrow. And we'll also send you an email tomorrow with the link so that uh, you can access it. So now uh, one more time, a huge thank you to all of all of our experts, especially that you had to stay late or wake up early and so on. And so thank you really one more time and to all our listeners for staying with us till us the end. And I wish you a good day and hopefully you'll join us again for our next webinar in Jan. Until then, thank you so much and bye-bye. <laughs>